Good morning. My name is Sangmin Lee, and I will be discussing novel strategies for patients with low risk myelodysplastic syndromes. Here are my disclosures. In this presentation, I will be discussing the treatment goals in MDS, strategies to treat low risk MDS patients, and some of the newly approved therapies for MDS as they pertain to this patient population. It is important to note that MDS is a heterogeneous disease. Commonly used tools for risk stratification is using IPSS and IPSSR, which incorporates cytogenetics, bone marrow blasts, as well as degree of cytopenias. By IPSSR, patients can be stratified to very low, low, intermediate, high, very high risk uh, categories. As you can see on these curves, both overall survival and rate of AML transformation vary depending on the IPSSR classification. Patients with lower risk MDS by IPSSR typically have longer overall survival and are less likely to have transformation to AML. Typically, when we refer to MDS patients as having lower risk MDS, we typically include patients with very low, low, and some patients with intermediate risk by IPSSR, and often these patients have decreased blast in their bone marrow. Because of different clinical course of MDS, treatment goals differ in patients with lower risk MDS compared to higher risk MDS. For lower risk MDS patients, general goal is to improve transfusion dependence, while for higher risk MDS patients, goals are to also improve overall survival, prevent progression to AML in addition to improving cytopenias. Here are the current treatment approaches we utilize for MDS that I will be reviewing in this presentation for lower risk MDS. For patients who are not transfusion uh, dependent or require very infrequent transfusions, supportive care with transfusion support is reasonable. In terms of intervention, several options are currently available, which include growth factor support, thrombocoidin receptor agonist, lenalidomide in select cases, loose powder sept, hypomethylene agents, as well as novel agents in context of clinical trials that are emerging. Anemia is present in about 80% of patients with MDS at diagnosis. Anemia as well as transfusion support is associated with um, significant morbidity. There are a number of erythropoiesis stimulating agents available in MDS. Most commonly used agents are either darbopoietin or ebotin alpha. There are various dosing schedules for each agent. In our clinic, we typically utilize darbopoietin alpha, which can be given every two weeks and can be dose escalated based on response or suboptimal response. Hematologic rate occurs in about 40 to 60% of patients, usually in 12 to 16 weeks with median duration of 15 to 18 months. In some instances, there are reported higher response rate when combining these agents with GCSF agents, especially if erythropoietin level is less than 500 and transfusion requirements are less than two units per month. Most common side effect of these agents are hypertension, fever, headache, and nausea, as well as chest pain. And it is important to note that these agents should be held if hemoglobin is greater than 10, given the risk of thrombosis uh, with these agents. About 40% of low risk MDS patients require red blood cell transfusions. Red blood cell transfusions can lead to iron overload and iron overload has been associated with end organ damage, including hepatic, cardiac, and endocrine dysfunctions. Retrospective studies have suggested possible benefits with iron chelation. The Telesto study has recently been published, which was a randomized prospective study of low-risk MDS patients comparing Defaraxirox versus placebo. This study began as a phase three study, but was amended to a phase two study due to low enrollment, um, mainly because of Deferox rocks, which was approved and used in some countries. Inclusion criteria included patients with low intermediate IPSS MDS, serum ferritin over 1000, 
red cell transfusion and red cell transfusion dependence. Patients were randomized two to one to receive deferoxorox at dose ranging from 10 to 40 milligrams per kilogram per day versus placebo. Primary endpoint was event-free survival defined by development of non-fatal event related to cardiac or liver dysfunction or AML transformation or death. While the study was not powerful for event-free survival difference after change to a phase two study, median event-free st- free survival was prolonged in the Deferox group at 3.9 years compared to three years. The most common adverse events were increased serum creatinine, um, diarrhea, and nausea. So for patients who have increased um, uh, uh, evidence of increased iron overload, um, as defined by serum ferritin over 1,000, iron chelation could be a considered option. Lena lidomide is utilized in low-risk MDS, especially for those with deletion 5Q abnormality. In MDS patients with deletion 5Q, use of lenalidomide can achieve red cell transfusion independence in about 67% of patients. It is important to note that dosing of lenalidomide used in MDS is lower than in multiple myeloma. In MDS, typical doses 10 milligrams per day or 21 days every month or continuously, and some patients may actually require a dose reduction due to development of cytopenias. Median time to response with lenalidomide is 4.6 weeks, and median duration of transfusion independence is 104 weeks or so. Lenalidomide has also been utilized and tested in patients without deletion 5Q. Uh, however, the response rate is lower with red cell transfusion independence in uh, 26% of patients. Most common side effects of lenalidomide are neutropenia and thrombocytopenia. Increased TGF beta ligand is uh, linked to ineffective erythropoiesis in MDS. Lutus patercept is a novel drug that has recently been approved that binds to TGF-beta ligand, which leads to decreased SMAT2, SMAT3 signaling, leading to erythroid maturation. Loose powder set was initially tested in low and intermediate one MDS patients anemia. In this study, loose powder set was dosed subcutaneously ranging from 0.1 to 5 milligrams per kilogram to 1.75 milligrams per kilogram every 21 days. Of 51 patients receiving higher dose loose powder sept, um, ranging between 0.75 to 1.75 milligrams per kilogram, 63% of patients achieved transfusion improvement as per IWG 2006 criteria. Higher response of about 77% was seen in those patients with SF3B1 mutation, and for those patients without SF3B1 mutation, hemoglobin improvement occurred in 40% of patients. Most common side effects were fatigue, bone pain, and diarrhea. Based on prior results showing high response rate in patients with SF3B1 mutation, a phase three clinical trial was done in MDS patients with Spatercept, which was the medalist trial. Key inclusion criteria included transfusion-dependent MDS patients with ring sideroblast, as defined by at least 15% ring sideroblast or at least 5% ring sideroblast with presence of SF3B1 mutation. Patients were included if they had IPSSR very low, low intermediate risk, and if they were transfusion dependent as defined by requiring at least two units of packed red blood cells every eight weeks. This was a randomized trial with two to one randomization with patients receiving either loose powder set or placebo. Starting dose of loose powder set was one milligram per kilogram every 21 days and primary endpoint was transfusion independence for eight weeks or longer during weeks one through 24. Primary endpoint was achieved with transfusion independence rate of 38% for loose powder set compared to 13% for placebo. It is unclear why a small proportion of placebo patients achieved transfusion independence. Patients were not allowed to be on their throats poetin stimulating agents on this trial. Median duration of transfusion independence was 30.6 weeks, and most common side effects were fatigue, diarrhea, asthenia, and nausea. Fatigue occurred in some patients despite uh, improvement in hemoglobin. It is important to note that thrombopoietin receptor agonists are not currently approved for MDS. However, two TPO agonists have been studied in MDS. Romy plus them was studied in phase one to trials with durable platelet response of 46%. And phase two randomized trial was done, which showed platelet benefit, but was halted early due to concern of evolution to AML with increased blast counts. Five years follow-up with the study showed similar AML progression, Romy plus them arm compared to placebo. 
El Trombo pack was also studied in a randomized phase two study with 47% platelet response compared to 3% for placebo with similar rates of AML transformation. In summary, TPO agonists can improve platelet counts in lower risk MDS patients, although transient increase in blast can occur, in which case the agents should be stopped. Increase in blast usually decreases off of these agents. Hypomethylene agents have been studied in lower risk MDS patients, both azacitidine and endocytidine have been studied in this setting. Azacitidine at dose of 75 milligrams per meter square subcutaneous for five days resulted in 35% hematologic improvement, 19% CR and 65% stable disease. The cytobine at 20 milligrams per meter square for three days it resulted in overall response improvement as defined by a CR, PR and a hematologic improvement of 23% with some hematologic improvement. Phase two randomized study um, comparing uh, low dose cytobine versus azacitidine in lower risk MDS patients were done, which included low and intermediate one MDS patients. Both decidabine and azacitidine were utilized on a three day um, schedule on this trial, um, and primary endpoint was overall response rate. Overall response rate was higher with decidabine at 70. 70 versus 49%, and hematologic improvement is higher with uh, decidabine at 24 versus 8%. Transfusion dependence was higher um, at 32% for decidabine versus 16% azacitidine, although not statistically significant. Median time to response was two months, and event-free survival seemed to be longer for decidabine, although it was not statistically significant. Mm -hmm. Both agents were well tolerated with rare grade two, grade three um, adverse events. Recently, um, oral decitabine and cetazuridine has been approved for MDS. Oral decitabine has been limited due to inactivation by cytidine deaminase in the GI and liver tract, and cetazuridine is an oral cytidine deaminase inhibitor that prevents inactivation of oral decitabine. Oral decitabine plus cetazuridine was uh, studied in a study phase two study comparing against uh, IV decitabine. This trial mainly included higher risk MDS patients. However, it did include some patients with intermediate one risk MDS. The patients were randomized between oral, starting with oral cetazuridine and decitabine versus IV decitabine, both at five day schedule. One group of patients received the oral decitabine first, then received IV decitabine in the second cycle versus IV the other group received IV decitabine first, then oral decitabine. The primary endpoints were oral and IV decitabine exposure, DNA methylation, and overall response rate. In the study population, as you can see, it included mainly higher risk MDS patients. However, 44% of patients in this study population had intermediate one risk via PSS and 47% were trans red cell transfusion dependent. In the study, there was similar decitabine systemic exposure and DNA methylation between the two groups and overall response rate was 60% with 21% of patients achieving CR. Hematologic improvement occurred in 16 patient of patients with 10% um, risk rate response, 2% neutrophil response, and 14% platelet response. Um, adverse events were similar between the two groups, between oral and IV decitabine, and there was no increased uh, GI adverse events for oral decitabine. Therefore, oral decitabine plus cetazuridine can be a consideration in pa certain patients for whom um, there is consideration of use of hypomethylene agents. The problem with low risk MDS, just like high risk MDS, is that overall survival and outcome are very poor in low risk MDS patients. On the left is treat both treatment free survival and overall survival of an analysis for patients with lower risk patients post uh, hypomethylene agents. And both um, treatment free survival and overall survival seem to be short at 15 months and 17 months, respectively. When looking at um, treatments that seem to uh, perhaps affect outcome um, on the right, stem cell transplant might suggest some benefit, although the problem with MDS is that majority of patients with uh, MDS are not candidates for stem cell transplant or intensive chemotherapy.
So there is an unmet need in MDS patients uh, after use of hypomethylene agents. And there are several um, uh, novel agents that are, are in development that can be considered in the future. Oral azacitidine has been recently been approved for a maintenance setting for AML and a phase three study was done comparing against um, placebo in lower risk MDS patients. And the results of that is pending at the moment. There are a number of ongoing clinical trials uh, in looking at lower risk MDS patients. For example, imatelstat has shown preliminary results of um, increased transfusion independence rate of about 42% with median duration of uh, 20, 20 months or so with 29% being transfusion independent for about a year or so. Phase three study uh, studying imatelstat is currently ongoing and will be open at Wild Cornell Medicine shortly. Some patients with MDS do progress to higher risk MDS, and we have a number of trials that are available at Mock Cornell Medicine, including combining venetoclax with hypomethylene agents, APR246 that targets TP53 mutation and MDS, IDH inhibitors, anti-CD47 compound compared, uh, combined with hypomethylene agents, as well as MCL1 inhibitor. So in summary, um, there are many uh, novel agents that are coming and are in clinical trials that can be considered for lower risk MDS patients um, after, uh, besides the current therapeutic options. In summary, um, improvement of cytopenias is a key goal for lower risk MDS patients. Anemia is the most common issue in lower risk MDS patients and there are several um, therapeutic uh, options that are available in this setting. Iron overload can be a concern for lower risk MDS patients due to um, transfusions and associated iron overload and iron chelation can be considered for patients with ferritin above 1,000, although tolerability of iron chelation agents are an issue. Not everyone can tolerate these agents. Erythropoietin stimulating agents are still first line for anemia uh, for low risk MDS patients and TPO receptor agonists can be a consideration in select group of patients. After erythrostimulating agents, um, lenalidomide can be considered, especially in those patients with deletion 5Q abnormality. And if patients have ring sideroblast or presence of an SF3B1 mutation, loose powder step should be considered. Besides those agents, hypomethylene agents can be considered. And in certain instances, oral decidabine can be considered when um, hypomethylene agents are considered for these patient populations. And um, if none of these approaches work, there are a number of novel agents that are in development for lower risk MDS patients and patients um, without um, standard of care options should be referred for clinical trials. This concludes my presentation and I will be happy to answer questions during the question and answer session.